Hi class and welcome to the third and final lecture uh, on existentialism. So the first lecture we talked about the major thinkers of existentialism. We talked about uh, existentialism as a kind of literary um, genre. Uh, we talked about the style of existentialism. Um, we briefly talked about some of the ideas and some of the works. In lecture two, we really started to get into the philosophy, and we talked about um, the four major themes of existentialism. I've boiled existentialism down in a reductive fashion to four themes. The first is existence precedes essence. If you remember from last time, this is the idea that um, what you are, your essence, is a result of your choices, so that you don't come into the world predefined. Uh, with the task of figuring out who you always were meant to be or who you really are deep down or whatever. It's that you just, you, uh, your essence is created through living. It's also the idea that life doesn't come prepackaged with an inherent meaning, is that it's up to the human being to give life a meaning and that you um, pursue activities, projects, uh, meaningful tasks in life and in and through engaging robustly and joyously with the world, you create your own sources of meaning and life becomes important to you for a variety of reasons. Um, so uh, again, it's important to note that many of the existentialists were atheists, but a lot of them were Christian too. The atheist existentialists said things like, look, there's no supreme authority that decides who you really are deep down, that shapes you, that's watching you, that um, is is um, is uh, creating a set of rules that you have to follow to 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 go to the afterlife um, for your soul to find eternity. Um, there's no one predefining you in advance. Um, that is up to you. Um, Christian existentialists basically agree with the atheist existentialists, people like Sartre and Camus. Christian existentialists like Kierkegaard and Maurice Merleau-Ponty said, this dilemma is just as relevant for us too. But people like Kierkegaard said, even if there is a supreme authority, how does that change anything about um, what becomes meaningful in my life or how I have to live? Don't all of the same questions still apply? Don't I still die a mortal death and all of that? So um, there is uh, some disagreement, but broad agreement among also among the religious and the atheistic existentialists. Um, we also talked last class about freedom. Um, and yes, the liberty sense of polit the political liberty sense of freedom matters, but what the existentialists really were talking about was the individual's free will, your freedom to choose, the fact that you are thrown into this world. There isn't anyone predetermining your behavior or your actions. There's no, there's no authority above that has a predefined set of rules, right or wrong, that you have to follow, you have to use your reason to figure that out. Free will is also, freedom is also the idea that um, that it is always up to you to choose, right? And so Kierkegaard talks about the idea of the fact that your free will can actually be quite scary, right? It is often the case that what freaks us out the most about life is um, being in a situation in which we could do one thing or we could do another thing, and we're completely responsible for the thing that we choose. And so the example Kierkegaard gives is standing on the edge of a cliff and realizing that what you are really afraid of most is not that you'll fall. That rarely happens that you just fall over. But actually, you're kind of afraid that if you wanted to, you could throw yourself off, right? It's the same idea of someone being afraid, uh, being up on a stage and being afraid that they're going to say the worst possible thing that they could say. Um, I remember there's a scene in The Office with Michael Scott in which Michael Scott is in an elevator and he's going up to um, sell his company, to his paper company to Dunder Mifflin. And... Um, the big secret is, is that his company is bankrupt. They have no money. And so they're really lucky that Dunder Mifflin is buying um, a company with no assets. And and uh, he goes up with uh, Pam and uh, with Ryan, and they're together going to go into this meeting with David Wallace uh, to, to sell the company uh, to Dunder Mifflin. And Michael is, is experiencing tremendous 
anguish. Um, Michael Scott is fearing his own freedom. He is worried that he's going to blurt out that the company's bankrupt. And so he's freaking out about that. And Pam and Ryan, of course, think he's really stupid, but that's actually kind of um, fundamental to the human condition that we're afraid of what we might do. Uh, and what the existentialist is saying is that it is the existential hero's job to overcome one's uh, what Kierkegaard called anguish, one's fear of one's own freedom. The true existentialist becomes an authentic individual by embracing um, the absurdity of the human condition, by embracing their own free will and taking responsibility for it and engaging with the world passionately, fearlessly, and being a moral human being, okay? And now, um, I would be happy uh, when we talk about this next class, to talk about the various criticisms of existentialism, there are many. Um, and one of those uh, criticisms is that existentialism talks about the fact that we have to take responsibility for our actions, um, embrace our freedom, and uh, proceed forth in the world in a moral fashion using our reason, but it doesn't tell us how to do that. Uh, existentialism tells us to, that we have to create our own meaning in life, but it doesn't really say how that's possible or what our own meaning should be based on, whether it's um, uh, bounded, there's like a set of things that the meaning can be, but there are other things that the meaning can't be. Uh, it doesn't, existentialism doesn't say what sorts of things really are wrong to derive meaning from. Um, it also doesn't tell us what what morality is, what's 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 right and what's wrong. It just tells us that it's up to us to figure it out. And so there there is a sense in which existentialism is a bit limited. Let's now talk about um, theme number three. This is the uh, we did not last class get to absurdity or responsibility. So let's now talk about absurdity. Okay. For homework, you were supposed to either read or watch um, videos of um, Camus' uh, famous essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, okay? Um, so so let's, uh, let's get into these last two themes. Theme number three is absurdity. And this is the claim that life is fundamentally absurd since there is no pre-packaged, innate, inherent meaning, purpose, or bigger point or plan to the world, okay? That means that the world is fundamentally absurd, right? And the absurd happens when we realize that there's no larger plan and we have to create order out of chaos. Um, so life is fundamentally absurd. There's no larger purpose or plan. We're just mortals spinning senselessly on a tiny rock in a corner of an indifferent universe. Given our condition as delicate, momentarily existing organisms, there is an absurd futility, or at least that's what it feels like, um, to our endeavors, our vanity, our vain materialistic strivings, our ideological um, convictions. And so this is what Camus' work, The Myth of Sisyphus, is all about. The myth of Sisyphus um, is, is a classic work. Um, and in it, uh, Albert Camus, the French Algerian philosopher, um, basically uses the ancient Greek myth of Sisyphus. Um, he uses the Greek legend of Sisyphus who is condemned by the gods to a truly uh, pointless task. Okay, uh, sorry, got a little bit lost there. Um, Sisyphus is punished by the gods. Sisyphus has to roll a rock, a boulder, up a mountain. And of course, once it gets to the top, every time it rolls back down again of its own weight. And Sisyphus is condemned for eternity to do it over and over again and again and again for all of eternity. And this task, this existential, absurd, futile task, this is a symbol of what Camus famously calls the absurd and the individual's persistent struggle against the essential absurdity of life. So what essentially Camus is doing is he's comparing our human condition, the um, futility of our strivings and the finality of death and our mortal condition, right, as biological organisms who have to get up in every morning and struggle against the absurdity of life. Um, you, and you know what I'm talking about. You're sitting there um, in your high school classes 
Um, sometimes they're exciting and sometimes they're boring and it feels like, why do I have to come here every day? Camus um, compared your act of waking up every morning to the same rote routine task to the absurd. Um, and of course, one can't think of anything more absurd than, you know, a lifetime filled with futile labor. And of course, Sisyphus being essentially chained to this rock, having to push a boulder up a hill only for it to reach the top and roll all the way back down is a, um, is a good example of this. When I have a good example of this too for my own life, when I was a little kid, I would build Lego towers. And eventually when I was, you know, nine or 10, I realized how absurd it was that I would get all excited and I would build this Lego castle or whatever the Lego kit was. And I had a lot of fun doing it or I was engaged in my task while I was doing it. But every time I would finish putting the Lego tower together, um, I, I realized I was always striving to get it done. But at the same time, even though there was a momentary satisfaction that I achieved when I finished the Lego castle, there was also a sense of sadness and absurd futility, a sense of kind of now what, right? I think people who strive at work to get the perfect office job and to get the promotion and to reach the seventh floor of their office building and to and once you finally made it you're excited for a minute and then you realize it's the same rote humdrum existence and so i'm not trying to depress you um camus talked a lot about this feeling and he says look let's not lie to ourselves this is a feeling that we all have um, let's talk a little bit more about the absurd. I've got this definition for you um, of the absurd, but in Camus, the myth of Sisyphus, um, Camus defines it a little bit more um, uh, precisely, right? Now, the, the absurd is a very important existential concept. It isn't a particularly technical concept, but it's important to distinguish it from other ways that we use the word absurd. In other words, many of the absurdities that we find in life um, are not what Camus means when he says the absurd. By the, by the absurd, Camus doesn't mean like, um, oh, that comedy that we just saw with Will Ferrell, that was absurd. Or your argument is absurd, meaning it's wrong. I disagree with you. Your argument's absurd. Um, what he means has more to do with what he would describe as an incongruity between what we fundamentally expect of the world and the fact that the world doesn't actually care what we expect from it. So the absurd for Camus is the recognition that we have a demand of the world. We demand um, all sorts of things of the world, but the world just doesn't care about us in return. It's this view that despite our hopes, despite our expectations um, for justice, for order, for salvation, for peace, for harmony, the world does not deliver, nor does it care. Right. And again, you can also tie this into the existence precedes essence. Camus is saying that it's your job to order the world. The world doesn't innately care about you. You have to do the caring. Uh, what is it that Steven Pinker says? Uh, pastries and cooked fish do not just land at your feet. Uh, you have to uh, create those things. You have to create wealth. Um, the world uh, doesn't just lay wealth at your feet. Um, so the world isn't is not in line with your expectations. For Camus is also true to say that the absurd has to do with the confrontation between our rational minds and a fundamentally irrational world or universe. We seek to order the world so that we can order our lives. But again, entropy rules the world and our task to put an order to things ends up being fundamentally absurd. Uh, parents probably know this if they have little kids. The second they have the house cleaned up, the house gets dirty again within minutes. And there's only a very brief satisfaction of, ah, um, when I built my Lego castle, when I was done, I had a brief satisfaction of, ah, this is great. And then I would say, now what? Right? I could play a little pretend game with my Lego castle, but you know, it, that became boring fairly quickly. And so I realized as soon as I had built that Lego tower, you know, within a day or two, I would knock it down and make something new from it. And this is Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill. Teachers know this, right? 
the start of every school year. You have a bunch of students that haven't learned your material yet, you ha that haven't learned your concepts yet. And you push the boulder up the hill and by the end of the year, they get what you've taught them, hopefully. They understand the ideas of philosophy, for example. And then the boulder rolls back down the hill, you get a deep breath over the summer and it starts all over again. And you have to push the boulder back up the hill. And after a career of 20 years, so you gotta be like really kind of understanding of your older teachers. They've been doing this for a long time. Do you think you're sick of being in high school because you've been in high school for three or four years? Your teachers have been teaching high school, some of them for 20 to 25 years. And every time the boulder gets up the hill, it rolls back down again and another crop of students come in. And so there's an absurdity to this, right? Um, Camus talked about the problem of evil uh, as being a good example of this. And if you remember from philosophy, the problem of evil is one of the proofs against uh, one of the one of the proofs for the non-existence of God. There's a bunch of proofs for the existence of God: the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the ontological argument. There's a bunch of arguments to say God does exist. And then in philosophy, you can also learn a bunch of arguments against um, the existence of God. And one of those is the problem of evil. And it's a very old um, theological problem, right? And this is the idea that um, there's evil in the world and uh, Judeo-Christian religions and most religions, in fact, have this concept of an all PKG God, an all powerful, all knowing, all good um, God, an omnipotent, omnipresent, omnibenevolent um, God. And, um, and so the problem of evil is the challenge to say, there's all this evil in the world. There are hurricanes that happen. There is widespread poverty. There is murder. There is rape. There is genocide. There are things like the Holocaust. There are things like um, the the Jim Crow South and slavery and racism and 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 brutality and and violence and war. And if God truly was all powerful, then He would have the power to stop it. Why doesn't He? If He's all knowing. So you can't say he doesn't know about it. That's why he's not stopping it. If he's all knowing, then he knows about it. And he also has the power to stop it, but he's not. So he knows about it. He has the power to stop it. He doesn't. And, and, and God is also all good. So all powerful, all knowing, all good. Um, if God was all good, surely he would stop the evil. And so the problem of evil, which uh, the philosopher John Rawls often talked about, for some people is a good example of why they don't think God exists. Now, um, oftentimes uh, the, the people that invoke this problem of evil do not mention um, the fact of theodicy, uh, which has been the religious, uh, the religious rebuttal to the uh, problem of evil, which is to say that um, for there to be any good in the universe, there also needs to be evil. For there to be good or bad in the universe, there needs to be free will, which means God has to allow things to happen. Um, God, that God gives people free will, and of course, if they choose to do evil with it, then that's um, really bad. But you can't solve the problem of evil by taking away everyone's free will, because then there's no such thing as evil, because nobody could have done otherwise. And remember, um, philosophy presupposes free will to some degree. It's the idea that there cannot be morally right or morally wrong. There cannot be good or bad unless people have the freedom to choose, right? It would make no sense to, to have a, an ethical theory if people didn't have free will. We talked about this last time. And so for the sake of there being goodness in the world, um, Christians and other religious philosophers will say God gives us free will, um, takes more of a hands-off approach in some ways, and then maybe they'll say every once in a while, God performs miracles that are beyond our understanding. And so um, for Camus, the problem of evil is a really good example of this um, imbalance between what we expect of the world, what our rational minds want the world to be, and the fact that the world just doesn't comport with what we want it to be. And so the problem of evil is this recognition that we think the world should be fundamentally good and ordered by an all-knowing, all-loving, all-caring God, um, but it, 
it, the world isn't that way. It doesn't care what we want or expect of it. And so the problem of evil is the recognition that um, it's fundamentally absurd um, that these things happen. There's no way this could all be prepackaged um, uh, that the world could have certain innate um, objective values or meaning attached to it. There's no way, given the problem of evil, that that could be the case. Uh, another sense of the absurd is the song that I cited last class by Not A Surf is a 90s indie band. And the lyrics say, do you ever feel like you just landed on this earth? You see the creatures all do their dances back and forth. And so in the song, you're picturing someone who goes out to a club and has this absurd moment of self-reflection where they kind of disattach themselves from everything. They kind of, um, there's a psychological distance going on. There's a, um, there is a uh, dislocation going on. And the person who goes to the club where everyone's dancing, uh, typically you'd go to the club and you'd dance with everyone and you'd get into the music and you'd have a good time and you wouldn't be self-conscious, but this person stops for a second. And if you kind of plug your ears and just you know, kind of cross your eyes and look at it in a certain way, what are all these creatures doing, right? Um, and so the song is, do you ever feel like you just landed on this earth? Like you're an alien experiencing this for the first time. And you're like, what are these weird creatures doing? You see the creatures all do their dances back and forth. And then the lyrics say, and then you get restless and join them on the floor. Suddenly it's tomorrow. It's not today anymore. So this is this idea of ultimately, it's a little bit of a hint of what Ken Liu is going to say the solution to this problem of the absurd is. And it's to, and part of it is to, is to join them. It may be absurd. The dance is the dance that the creatures are doing. But you might just want to try the dance of life and see if if something meaningful rises out of that. But we're getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves. Another good example I thought of to explain the absurd to you uh, is what happens when a um, and parents experience this a lot. What happens when a little kid asks their parents um, a question? Right? They call this the. Um, the the chain of justification right this is a quest for explanation for justification for an account that makes an action or event comprehensible uh, so little kids will often ask you know uh daddy or mommy why do i have to go to school and daddy or mommy will say um, because you have to go to school to learn and the child will say well why do i have to learn and the mommy or daddy will say, because you have to grow up to be smart so that you can lead a successful life. And then the child will, will say, well, why do I have to lead a successful life? And the parent will say, uh, well, what will they say? They will say, um, so that you can um, uh, be happy. And the child says, well, why should I be happy? What's the point of happiness? Why should I be, why, why would I wanna be happy, why? And eventually, Every why leads to another why. Eventually, this chain of justifications, the parent runs out and says, I don't know why. Right. And the parent, well, the parent might try to go further and say, because it's good to be happy. And the kid might say, well, why is it good? And the parent might say, because you want to live a life where you're happy with everything that's going on and you're satisfied. And the child might say, well, what is good? Or um, why do I want to live, live that kind of life? eventually the parent is going to basically say, get in the car, you're going to school, right? Because there is, and, and what Camus is getting at in his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, is he is trying to answer the, 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 ir, the irreducible question at the end. The, the, the series of whys that lead to nowhere, he's trying to answer that last why. And so in The Myth of Sisyphus, if you read it or if you watch the videos, Camus talks about the fact that there are all these problems in philosophy, right? There are problems about, oh, the ship of Theseus and is a cloud an object? Um, why, is a, why is a cloud not an object, but a chair is an object? And um, what if we don't exist, man? And, and all of these questions, or even more intensely um, narrowly focused microscopic questions about language and what, um, and uh, uh, does language create meaning or does meaning create language and all this other stuff. And Camus' point in the myth of Sisyphus is to say, none of that matters until you've answered the irreducible why. That last question, why is life worth living? What's the point of all of this? Uh, what's the point of us being here? Um, given the absurdity of life and the absurdity of the human condition, that last question is the question that 
Camus says is the most important question. And fundamentally, and this is kind of the, the thing that's hard to talk about in a philosophy class, but um, it's important. Um, the, the central question of Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus is, given how absurd life is, given the fact that there's no inherent meaning in life, given the fact that everything we do seems absurd, given the fact that one day leads to another and time becomes your enemy and there's no stopping time and the absurd Sisyphean struggle moves on every day, wouldn't it be better to just kill yourself is what um, Camus asks. And it sounds like a, an almost immature, um, morbid, overly morbid, um, melodramatic question. But it really isn't. Now, um, in the beginning of the essay, Camus talks about the fact that the most important question in life and in philosophy is whether or not it's worth living. That's what Camus is asking. He's not just saying, why shouldn't we kill ourselves? He's kind of saying, why is the world worth living? And let's not bother with all of these sort of um, Galilean questions, right? Let's not worry uh, ourselves about all these like remote questions about logic, chopping logic and analytic philosophy until we've figured out what, why is life worth living? And so we ask this fundamental question, given that life is absurd, given that there doesn't seem to be any meaning um, underneath this. And again, let me remind you at this point, you don't have to agree with anything the existentialists are saying here. You don't have to agree, agree with Camus. You don't have to agree with Sartre that life, life is innately meaningless. A lot of people would disagree with you. In fact, I'm very much on the fence about this. Um, Aristotle would disagree. Kant would disagree. There are so many other philosophies besides existentialism that would say, hold up on your first premise. Life isn't absurd. Life does have an inherent meaning. You can't create your meaning. That's impossible. You're a bounded creature with a human nature. Your meaning is in some sense already uh, uh, innate. Uh, you come into the world understanding certain archetypes. Um, there are certain anthropocentric truths that imply deductively certain values. Fine, there are all sorts of, Locke probably wouldn't agree with the existentialists, but we're examining the existentialists. And Camus' central question is, in this absurd life, given that life is essentially Sisyphus's task of pushing a boulder up a hill for eternity to only to have it roll back down. And in fact, it's even worse because it's not for eternity. In fact, you just push the boulder up a hill and it rolls back down until you freaking die. Given that that's the case, why should I not be in despair? Why should I not want to just end it all right now? So Camus makes clear at the outset of his essay that he's not talking about clinical depression, in, uh, which is something that you can't really control. It's just this um, extreme depression that is a kind of um, sickness. You're ill. You can't even get out of bed. He's talking about philosophical depression. He's talking about the realization that life feels fundamentally futile. It feels fundamentally absurd. Why are we doing what we're doing? What's the point of living? Which most intelligent human beings have asked a question like that, at least at some point in their life. And he's trying in good faith to answer that question. What's the point of it all? Why should we keep living? And that sort of thing. Um, there's an existentialist philosopher that sadly passed away too early. He was very famous University of Texas at Austin um, philosopher named Bob Solomon. And he talks about another example of what the absurd means, if you're having a hard time understanding what the absurd means. Um, and he talks about the fact that when he was a little kid, he would look at it, a, a big poster in his um, classroom of the solar system, and he would see how tiny the planet is. And he would see kids pointing to the third rock from the sun and saying, Look, this is us on that tiny little dot, right? And you can think of the shift in perspective that was caused by that photograph in the 60s that uh, we call um, Earthrise. Earthrise was the first photograph of the Earth uh, appearing to rise from the surface of the moon. And so there are many ways in which this is interesting. In one sense, it is uh, a mirror reflection of our planet hanging in space. And so uh, some people say that the Earthrise photograph was 
um, a catalyst for um, the environmental movement is to say, look how fragile and precious and vulnerable our planet is. It, it's really very easy to see that from the surface of the moon. Look at how fragile our planet is. We better take care of it because we're the stewards of this earth. And if, if, um, if, if we destroy this, this planet, it's the only one that we have. But another thing that it did was to say, wow, um, we thought we were the center of everything. We thought our home, our cosmos, our earth, we thought that we were sort of the center um, of, of everything. And, but in fact, here we are from a different perspective, off in the distance, earth rise. This was magnified when um, Carl Sagan um, spun the Voyager spacecraft around. I believe it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's from uh, Saturn. And it's a picture of Earth as a pale blue dot. And that's called the pale blue dot photo. And it basically shows the planet Earth as this tiny, little tiny speck. It's like a little moat suspended in a sunbeam. And here's a quote from Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot. I have the book. It's a, it's a brilliant book. It's, an, it's a beautiful meditation on what it means to be human. And I'm going to read you a quote from it because, not because Sagan was an existentialist, but because this passage really does get at what Camus means when he talks about the absurd. So Sagan says, uh, look, at, and the book's called The Pale Blue Dot. And, and he's got the picture up. Look at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves, but there's a sense in which this feeling can bring you comfort. So, that's Carl Sagan talking about what Camus calls the absurd. And Camus' question is, given that all that's the case, why do we do the things we do? Why do we live the way that we live? There's also a funny scene from um, The Office, right, when Michael Scott um, talks about this. I know I always reference The Office, but that's because it's such a great show. And Michael Scott um, says... You know, sometimes to get perspective, and remember, this is after um, Michael Scott has been roasted, right? He hosts a roast uh, of himself uh, to raise money and um, for some charity, and everyone shows up, and really, they go at him hard, harder than he ever thought that they would. And he says, you know, sometimes to get perspective, I like to think about a spaceman on a star incredibly far away, and our problems don't matter to him because we're just a distant point of light. But he feels sorry for me because he has an incredibly powerful microscope and he can see my face. And then if you remember, Michael um, waves to the sky, right? Um, you can even think of the absurd in terms of the timeline of things in our universe, right? Um, the universe is 14 point something billion years old um, uh, or 14 point something billion years since the Big Bang. On Earth, something like 4.5 billion years, right? Um, the dinosaurs roaming the Earth a couple hundred million years ago um, wiped out 65 million years ago. 
um, human beings, right? We tend to think we're the most important thing. Uh, we're the center of everything. Uh, human beings depends, I guess, what exactly you measure from, uh, how far you go. But we've been around for less than a couple hundred thousand years, right? Something like that. Um, what we call history, right? Recorded history is, you know, something like five to six thousand years. America is, is what, um, uh, 200, not even 250 years. Um, my lifetime, my lifetime, 32 years, right? This timeline should make you feel insignificant, right? The, the, the span of time that we, in our uh, self-flagellating self-importance, um, haven't even been around time-wise for, for but a second, right? And so all of these, that sort of repositioning, that fragmentation, that dislocation that I'm describing, um, you know, from our, our place in the cosmos to our place in the timeline of things, all of this makes you feel absurd. And one of the interesting points that Camus makes, and here he is starting to get to a solution, because the amazing thing about Camus' myth of Sisyphus is not that he asks the question, what's the point of living, is that he actually comes up with an answer. And the answer is, there is a point of living. No, you should not kill yourself. Absolutely not. One of the things that Camus says is, the thing that we call absurd is a result of your participation in the world. The absurd is a result of human beings' participation in the world. Human beings' conflict with the world. Your search for meaning in the world. So, while the absurd may seem to be alienating, the absurd wouldn't even exist if you weren't here, which means that you can't actually solve it. You might think you'd be able to, but you can't solve it by making yourself not here, right? The reason you can't solve it is because the, if you, and Camus asks, why shouldn't we just kill ourselves, right? Well, that's not a solution, right? The reason that's not a solution is is that when you're alive and you feel like things are absurd, it's not like by killing yourself, suddenly things become not absurd for you anymore. There just isn't a you anymore. It doesn't solve the problem. It steps around it. It negates the problem. It doesn't actually solve the problem. The problem of the absurd would be man conquering the absurd, man overcoming the absurd, man pushing on through life despite the absurd, okay? So now going back to the Sisyphus story itself, Camus' argument is, look, life is not easy. And he makes a list. The feeling of the absurd comes from the nausea of mechanical daily existence, the same routine day after day. And there are some good um, quotes for this. Um, and this is the quote here, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem that is suicide judging whether or not life is worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. Uh, and here he is talking about the fact that um, no one would die for the ontological argument. Those aren't the real concerns of philosophy. I have never seen anyone die for the ontological argument. Whether the earth or the sun revolves around the other is a matter of profound indifference. Um, and here he is describing the absurd. I mentioned the same routine day after day, the nausea of mechanical daily existence. In fact, one of the most famous existentialist texts of all time is called Nausea, and it's by Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, Camus says, living naturally is never easy. You continue making the gestures commanded by existence for many reasons, the first of which is habit. Dying voluntarily implies that you have recognized, even instinctively, the ridiculous character of that habit, the insane character of that daily agitation, and the uselessness of suffering. So why should you go through it, is his question. And I'm going to tell you at the outset, uh, Camus' answer is suicide is not the answer. There are certain people who are suicidal that can't help it, that had a very extreme medical depression, and those people deserve our support, and they deserve our help, and they and they and they need to get um, help with that. Camus is talking about a more philosophical reflection that might lead you to um, think that you shouldn't continue on, right? And so um, that is the uselessness of suffering, right? 
She says, rising, streetcar, four hours in the office or the factory, meal, streetcar, four hours more of work, meal, sleep, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, according to the same rhythm. But one day the why arises, right? Um, and then what Camus says is, that why arising, that is when you begin to think. That's when you begin to wake up. And he says, beginning to think is beginning to be undermined. And when I teach this in class, I often ask students what they what this means, and they kind of get it, right? The idea of, um, you can even think of it uh, in the sense of, let's say you're LeBron James and you're playing in a basketball game. The second he begins to really reflect uh, and think about what he's doing and be self-conscious, that's when his game falls apart. That's when he gets out of the flow of things, right? And so a lot of people are content to live their lives in the zone, in the flow of things, not questioning anything. Um, but Camus says, yeah, beginning to think whether it's sports or life is, is when you start becoming undermined. That's when the problems arise, right? And so he says, men at, at certain moments of lucidity, the mechanical aspect of their gestures, their meaningless pantomime makes silly everything that surrounds them. A man is talking on the telephone behind a glass partition. You cannot hear him, but you see his incomprehensible dumb show. You wonder why he is alive. Um, and he also says this really interesting quote, which is, everyone lives as if no one knew. And I might ask you, what does Camus mean here? And you might wanna pause the video now and to think about that for yourself. But I can tell you certainly one thing that this means is that we go through the world um, not thinking about the absurdity of life, not thinking about the futility of our strivings, not thinking about the approaching finality of our deaths. And this is probably a good thing, right? We wouldn't live a happy life probably if we were always thinking about that. But one of the things that the existentialist philosophers thought was you also wouldn't live a happy life if you didn't think about that from time to time, if you didn't, so to speak, memento more, reflect on your death to know how precious people are in your lives. And uh, so Camus says everyone walks around this world going about their day-to-day -day routine as if they don't know that sort of deep feeling of absurdity, right? Um, and there are ways in which, when they don't know, they actually behave in ways that are anti-existential. And so one of the projects of existentialism was to, was, to, was to know the absurdity of life, was not to hide from it, but to be a strong um, existential individual with free will. So a lot of times, realizing the absurdity, everyone acts as though no one knew. Well, when the individual does realize the absurdity of life, Sometimes defense mechanisms creep in, right? Defense mechanisms are the act of hiding the truth from yourself, essentially um, to protect your ego so that you can go on um, uh, uh, nursing and protecting and coddling your ego. Um, admitting the dark truth of life will be threatening to your psyche, right? So self-deception is convincing yourself of a truth or lack of truth so that you don't reveal any self-knowledge of the deception or so that you can protect your ego from dissonance which would be harmful to your own self-esteem. So don't do that, the existentialists say. That's not an answer to the absurd. One consequence of the realization of life's absurdity is alienation, which is why a lot of times artists and outsiders and thinkers often feel alienated from others because they realize something about the world that others don't, right? Uh, you got the corporate suit over there living life uh, you know, driving a sports car to work, doing the nine to five, got the, got the beach house, got all of this. Do they ever stop and ask the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? How is this meaningful? How is this, um, how is this, um, how is this, uh, you know, gonna, gonna help me, uh, bring meaning to my life? So alienation is the state or experience of being isolated from a group or activity to which one should belong or in which one should uh, be involved. So absurdity alienates you from others. It prevents you from getting into that flow, right, which you need to be accepted by others. It is, quote, estrangement from other people, society, or work, a blocking or disassociation of a person's feelings, causing the individual to become less effective. The focus here is on the person's problems in adjusting to society, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, 
And the one thing I would ask you, and I ask this every year to my students, but you're not here to answer me, is what moments or situations in life seem absurd to you? I've gotten all sorts of really interesting, fun, um, wild, wacky ex uh, examples that I, I just really love. Um, uh, kids have talked about going to family reunions and not knowing any anyone there, but um, knowing that they're supposed to care um, anyways and, and all of this stuff. And so um, there are all sorts of examples that you could come up with. And I would encourage you to think about some. Um, just, I, I think it's really interesting. Um, now, th again, the fundamental question, the, uh, the absurd results from the nausea of mechanical daily existence, um, the, asking the question why, uh, the absurd results from the divorce, um, between man and his life, uh, that is human beings and their life. Uh, the absurd is manifests itself when the certainty of death, when you learn of that for the first time, when you're, uh, you know, 10 or 11 and you think about what death actually means. It comes from believing that each day is subject to tomorrow. Uh, these are my notes on having read the myth of Sisyphus. So I'm actually reading these bullet points out to you. And it comes uh, when intelligence recognizes that it cannot understand the world. The world is irrational. And so the fundamental question is, does absurdity require one to escape it through hope or should one take the other route out? Um, and so the question is, does the absurd dictate death. And Camus says, no. Again, the absurd depends as much on man as on the world. You can't, you can't commit suicide and then it's not like you're going to wake up and breathe a deep sigh and go, ah, there's no more absurd. No, you've circumvented the problem. So suicide is not the answer, which is why Camus' text, it's always painted as this dark thing. I actually had to read this senior year of high school. So I read the myth of Sisyphus in high school and I remember thinking how hopeful it was and it was meant to be hopeful. Um, what is Camus' answer to the absurd? Okay, Camus' answer is that Sisyphus is an absurd hero and the question is, what makes this sad figure a hero? Well, it's clear from reading the essay that the Sisyphus story can be read and interpreted in two different ways. The first one is this, and this is Camus' answer. This is his like solution to the absurdity of life. The first one is this. Sisyphus is a hero because, and this is the way Camus puts it in, in language that's a bit archaic and pro is probably amusing to young people now, but it's language that people used at the time. He said, Sisyphus makes his rock his thing. He puts himself into his labor. And one can imagine Sisyphus as he rolls the rock up the mountain, absurd though his task might be. One can imagine Sisyphus coming to notice, coming to appreciate, coming to even love the various contours and markings on the rock itself. Sisyphus comes to study and appreciate and become very fond of what he notices as he climbs the mountain, the various bumps and levels that the rock has to proceed along. He becomes, he looks forward to it. Essentially what Camus says is one of the answers is one way you can be an absurd existentialist hero like Sisyphus is to do what Sisyphus does and throw yourself into your passions. Sisyphus throws himself into his labor. And the consequence of this, Camus tells us, is that Sisyphus must, in his own way, be considered happy. In other words, there's meaning, even in the most routine chores and tasks, whether it's at the office or if that's at home. And there's a way in which Camus is saying that by embracing the absurd, and getting into what you're doing. That's the route to happiness. You'll never be happy outside of it looking down on how absurd it is. Embrace the absurdity and live that life. So just think of being given some routine chore or task or work to do, whether it's school, whether it's at home, whether it's yard work, whether it's at the office. There's a way of doing it that's basically guaranteed to give you a bad time, right? And that is if you're always looking at your watch thinking about how absurd it is that you have to do this work. If you're always looking at your watch and seeing how much more time you've got to go, 
or if you're looking at the task itself and you're saying, oh, I'm only a third of the way through, as you continue to reflect on what you're doing, your reflection, in a way, undermines the experience and makes it tortuous, which is why he says beginning to think is beginning to be undermined. It poisons the experience. There's a sense in which uh, Camus is saying that insofar as you're able to get into what you do, uh, to make yourself really love what you do, love the process, even if it might be tedious or painful sometimes, as long as we can immerse ourselves, we can live our lives to the fullest and make meaning of our lives, embracing our freedom and our responsibility. There is a beauty, there is a meaning in that. And the, I want to give you the second answer that Camus gives. And that is the revolt. And you'll see here, the absurd dies only when we turn away from it. So that's the other solution. You can get into it and embrace it, or you can turn away from it and revolt, rebel, live a rebellious life, right? So this answer is probably a bit more difficult to stomach. Who wants to live that way? It's rebellion. But it's the idea that Sisyphus takes on his task because he has to. But he takes it on with a kind of resentment, which can give him meaning, which can give him strength, which can give him energy, right? He resents the gods who have so condemned him, right? So the basic idea is that what keeps Sisyphus afloat as the rebel, right? What keeps his life meaningful is that he shakes his fist at the gods while he's doing his task, right? With, as Camus puts it, scorn and defiance. So scorn and defiance, who thought, who would have, who would have, who would have thunk? Who would have thought that scorn and defiance might be one answer to the absurd? That is, Sisyphus never succumbs to the absurd. So Camus' second answer against the absurd is rebellion. And this was central to Camus' political philosophy too, right, with regard to the Algerian War. He was clear. Rebellion meant refusing to go along with the authority, with their cruel policies, right, with their infliction of suffering. So for Sisyphus, he doesn't stop pushing the rock. He can't. It's his fate. So he embraces it in a way. But instead, he does so in an act of rebellion. He rebels in the sense that he refuses to accept the absurdity that's been imposed on him. And that's where the last theme, responsibility, comes in, right? And so I'll read this, um, this to you. The solution to Camus' dilemma, re revolt, freedom, passion. Suicide is the wrong response to the absurd. The world can only be absurd in the first place if you are living it. Without man, the absurd doesn't exist. So you can't deal with it by suicide. Accepting the absurd and rebelling against it is the only option. Those are your only two options. Regardless, you have to accept your own freedom, okay? And becoming a champion of the absurd. To rebel against the absurd, you live in the moment, you embrace all that life has to offer, you don't, um, you, you don't uh, believe in the absurdity, you fight against it, right? And you create your own values. You don't let the task or the gods that condemn you to your task give value to your existence, you give it value. And you achieve through your acceptance of your own freedom, through your acknowledgement of the hard truths of life and authenticity. And to achieve this, the existentialist thought, and this is Sartre's term, you had to avoid bad faith and you become an existential individual by accepting your freedom, taking responsibility for your life, not blaming your problems on others and pursuing an authentic identity amidst the social and economic pressures of modern society, not conforming, but becoming your own person, right? And I'm gonna end the lecture with this and it's a very famous existentialist term. You might want to ask, how do we um, become an authentic self, right? And Sartre said the easiest way to think about it is to not exist for others. Now, it's good to be altruistic. It's good to think about others. It's good to um, care about others. It might even be good to think, care what others think of you. But there's a way in which some people do not become existential heroes, do not become the best person they can be 
when they are what Sartre calls being for others. And being for others is existing for and conceiving of one's identity in and through the imagined subjectivity of others. And so this is when you construct your identity based on your perception of what you think they want you to be. And so then you become an amalgam just of your possibly false perception of what you think others want to see in you, right? And so Sartre called this, um, uh, when a person avoids experiencing their own authentic subjectivity by identifying themselves with the look of the other. And so your actions, your thoughts, what you think is right, everything conforms to how you imagine others are perceiving you and how they might feel about you. And this results in inauthentic identity construction, loss of self, low self-esteem, and lack of autonomy and freedom. And of course, in this way, you're not able to accept your responsibility. And um, it can also result in really bad um, suffering. So Sartre writes an essay, Sartre writes a short story called Childhood of a Leader. And just briefly, in this story, there's a kid named um, Lucian. And he grows up, he doesn't really have friends, he struggles with his sexuality, um, people don't accept him, um, he's having a really rough go of things. And he goes to a party, and he gets into a fight with a Jewish person. And this story takes place uh, in, uh, in the pre-war, uh, pre-World War II era of France, in which there's a lot of anti-Semitism going on. And he, he's not anti-Semitic, but he gets into a fight at a party with a Jewish kid, and he punches the Jewish kid in the face. And there are a bunch of fascist, uh, proto-fascist youth kids there. There's a proto-fascist youth group at the party. And they celebrate Lucian for what he did. And they start calling him Lucian, the one who hates Jews. And Lucian's not actually anti-Semitic. He doesn't hate anyone. But they defined him. And for the first time, he saw himself through the eyes of others. And he liked the way it felt. He had an identity. People expected something. They constructed his identity for them. They celebrated him for the first time. They said, yeah, Lucian, man, he really hates Jews. And Lucian said, yeah, I guess I do. I guess that I guess I'm Lucy and the one who hates Jews. And so the whole story is about how this kid becomes more and more anti-Semitic because he's trying to conform with what others expect him of him, and he eventually becomes a dictator. We are running out of time. I have to stop. I have a class in a few minutes. So, uh, man, I wanted to go on for another half an hour, but we just won't have time. We'll have to talk about this a little bit more next week. And um, so thank you for listening. That is the third and final lecture. We will have class next week, and I will see you then. Thanks for listening.